the idea for this for this workshop uh, is not to really be a conventional workshop. It's to actually find places where this stuff can take hold in, in your community or elsewhere, and then to start talking about what that looks like as a beginning step towards us actually helping you. Uh, one of the reasons why we stopped talking at conferences like these was because we had workshops for entertainment value, and it's always good for people to enjoy stuff. I think good stuff when I go to know. But uh, we're, we're especially interested in places where it's going to touch the ground. Uh, and so that's, that's the point of, of the thing. So, uh, a couple things I didn't have time to cover uh, at the talk. Uh, generally, these talks, you know, 45, 50 minutes, maybe a little longer, but they're a condensation of uh, 15 hours of these democracy school trainings. So, who has been through democracy school here in this room? Wow. Okay, that's good. All right. So, uh, for others uh, maybe asking what the hell is Democracy School, uh, Democracy School, there are two-day trainings that we run. They're Friday evening, all day Saturday. And essentially, they, they start with the regulatory system and talk about how the regulatory system funnels us like cattle in, into a chute uh, and then puts a bolt over our head at the bottom uh, with the regulatory points, is what we call it. And then on Saturday, we track the history because it's really an attempt to answer why. You know, when you're up against something in the community, why do you not have certain rights when you go up against the corporation? And so it's an attempt to answer that by going all the way back to the 1600s. So we look at English law principles, and then we actually bring them forward through the Constitution, and then show how those doctrines are still very much alive today, and how your impact, the impact of you uh, from those doctrines is very much the same as it was 400 years ago, and that the doctrines have in fact expanded and enlarged, so they're more powerful today than before. So it's our understanding and our belief that you have to know how the system is structured first before you begin to actually take it apart. Uh, and so that's what the democracy schools are about. We've graduated about 5,000 people through them, uh, and we've taught them in 24 different states at this point. We've also taught them in Northern Ireland, uh, and did a couple sessions in Italy, and places around the world because folks are interested in that kind of knowledge as well, especially in other legal systems that are based on the English economy. So those are the democracy schools. The other piece I didn't get to cover was what's exactly in the ordinance. You know, we talk about local lawmaking. As you guys can probably figure out at this point, the law itself is not what the organizing is about. The law itself is just ink on paper. The organizing is up here. It's, it, it's really, you know, my predecessor, Richard Grossman, who gave a presentation here 10 years ago, I think, uh, who built himself as a historian, he used to say that the major work that has to be done today is cyclically being a self-governing entity. That's a huge shift in American law. The retainer agreements we sign with municipalities say, we understand that that's a huge shift in American law, and we authorize you to argue that in the courts when we get there. Uh, but all to say, that's how that's how these things are constructed. And a final word before I turn it over to Pushka, uh, with your answers about how the frame is working. And I think as the environment gets worse, as we suffer ecosystem collapse, we're to a point where more and more people are able to hear that. But right now, the only people that can hear it from our work over the last 15 years are the folks in affected communities who are being hit with the thing that they're trying to stop. I've given up hope on the progressive liberals to actually put their arms around any of this stuff. And so we've had fights with the Sierra Club and with other major environmental groups who actually tried to stop the organizing in the United States in certain places and, believe it or not, actually tried to stop the rights of nature stuff from moving in Ecuador. So we had the international environmental organizations who met with us at 1 o'clock in the morning to try to convince us to drop the rights of nature language from the constitutional stuff because they thought it endangered their ability to run the regulatory U.S.-style legislation that they wanted to put in place. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> and so uh, that's been our experience. That's where we come from. We're looking for people with similar philosophy, but we're also looking for people who are going to put in 20, 40 hours a week to actually make that. Because none of this is easy. And when you're in a municipality and the municipal officials say, well, we're going to get sued, it's going to bankrupt us, your taxes are going to go up, all those fear stuff, you know, the jobs and the, and the government's going bankrupt and your tax, all that fear shit has been around for a long time. They've perfected it on the other side. They know exactly what to do. They know how to access it. And over the past 15 years, we've used some of these states and, and localities as a laboratory to figure out exactly how the attacks come in and then exactly how the best way is to customize the ordinances so that they become liberation documents. They're organizing vehicles. They're not just what's on paper. 
and then how we use the litigation process to actually carry those ordinances into court in a way that actually opens people's eyes up. One of the things I didn't get to talk about in that room, in the ballroom, was that in addition to the litigation that's been filed against these ordinances, in Pennsylvania, we had the state legislature take steps to strip municipalities of any power to adopt local ordinances on issues like agribusiness operations. It was in the form of a law called ACRE, and it actually empowered the Attorney General of the state with your taxpayer dollars to represent the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in court against the municipality. So the way that this works is that the corporation picks up the phone in PA, they call the Attorney General's office, and the Attorney General becomes the plaintiff in the suit against your municipality, not the corporation. And so in PA, what happened next gave me a lot of hope, which was one municipality, after the Attorney General's office came in and said, well, you can't do this, we're going to sue you to overturn this ordinance that you passed. They promptly turned around and passed an ordinance that suspended the Attorney General's jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> Basically say, fuck you, if you're going to come in here and do that, we're going to exercise our lawmaking to, to actually take deeper steps towards that. So they said the AG can't enforce non-democratic laws like Acre in our municipality. And so it's that mindset that has to, you know, I ask speakers all the time when I go to conferences, what are we doing to cultivate civil disobedience? What are we doing to cultivate uh, non-obedience? What is, in our work does that? And we've attempted to put together a scaffolding or a framework that gets us to that place so that more and more people can actually understand how the system functions. I think we operate in a camouflage system. Most people don't see how the system actually functions. Most people think that it works okay. Even when they're on the receiving end of stuff, they will still defend it as a democratic system. This work is actually about pulling those blinders off and doing it in a way that uses the energy of the state and energy of the corporation to automatically begin to radicalize not just five people at a time, but 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 in the community. There's no better organizing tool when the Attorney General shows up in your municipality and tells you that you can't pass the law that you want to pass. <laughs> or says, thank you, good citizens of X, that you've passed this law, but now we're going to sue you to remove it. That's an organizing tool for us when people see the state operating that way, that it's not just a corporate problem, that it's a governmental problem, that should it be an aid a certain way to act in that sense. So two other things I'll turn over to Kai. One is that uh, in November of 2010, the city of Pittsburgh became the largest municipality that we've served as council to, to adopt one of our ordinances. So in the city of Pittsburgh, what they did was they banned fracking, so gas extraction within the city. They also recognized that ecosystems, like the Monongahela River ecosystem in the city of Pittsburgh, have rights to exist and flourish and evolve. In other words, created rights of nature in the city. And they also moved to refuse to recognize gas extraction corporations as having constitutionally guaranteed rights within the city of Pittsburgh. So, in other words, again, it doesn't matter what's necessarily on paper, but we have to think about that as an organizing vehicle. How do we draw the right fight? Because right now we draw a fight, but they're not the right one, then we all go home, lick our wounds, and then claw on to something else. This is actually about the long-term stuff I'm coming into play. So, what's in the ordinances? Well, in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, it's a local bill of rights. It's a community bill of rights. It's a concept that this work is about expanding out state and federal bill of rights protections to actually expand out local bills of rights to include things like rights to nature, rights, rights of nature, rights to a sustainable energy future, right to clean air and clean water, basically the rights that many of us in this room probably feel that we should have or that we already have that we don't, uh, that need to be built into an expanded legal structure. And the idea there is so you're not always on the defensive, so you're not always a no group or a no movement to say we don't want that here, you know, being defensive. It's about actually being proactive and about putting in a positive vision so that people ask you what kind of community you want, you can say this is the kind of community that we want, one that actually has this rights construct in it. The second part of the Pittsburgh ordinance and these other ordinances are actually prohibitions on activities that violate the rights. So if you have a right to a sustainable energy future in your community, and fracking can't be done because fracking is inherently unsustainable because it's an extraction of a fossil fuel, then you can't carry out fracking within the municipality because it automatically violates that bill of rights. We actually write those prohibitions directly in. And the third part is what we call the insulators. 
The insulators are the direct attacks on the structure of law that would normally prohibit your community from banning fracking within your municipality. So challenges to preemption. They nullify permits issued by the state and federal governments that are issued in violation of the local ordinance. They have a Dillon's rule in there, override, saying that your community has a right to local <coughs> governance, which in essence is a repudiation of Dillon's rule. And then they have corporate commerce and corporate personhood stuff in them, refusing to recognize that corporations can't afford themselves of those remedies. What does that do when we get into court? Well, from an organizing perspective, it makes the corporation not just say that the fracking ban is illegal, which of course what they're going to do, but they also have to come in and validate each of those legal doctrines that's contained within the ordinance. And it's that litigation process that begins to get more and more people to actually see through the camouflage about how the system actually functions. So it's an organizing strategy linked to the legal stuff as a means of moving further and moving higher in the organizing. The other question that people ask sometimes frequently, is, you know, along with what's the point? This is just going to get struck in court. Well, the idea is that you find multiple levels for that for that movement. In other words, you pass an ordinance. If the ordinance gets struck, you move to home rule. Uh, we can talk more about home rule here, but home rule is essentially a process available to people in 40 states to rewrite or write for the first time local constitutions for their municipality. Basically, overrides your elected officials and writes a new charter for the municipality. It's a higher law than an ordinance. It's harder to strike. It's harder to overturn. I mean, it doesn't mean it can't be. Uh, but it puts you in a better strategic position than just the ordinance. So we've assessed the system with the home rule stuff as well as the ordinance stuff. And eventually, as I said in the talk, the idea is to be driving towards a place where we're eventually giving birth to a forced state <coughs> constitutional change that actually recognizes the right to local self-governance for those communities, and then eventually build further down the road into the federal constitutional change that has to occur, which is about stripping corporations of personhood rights, commerce clause rights, uh, all that other stuff that's mixed into that. So that's the idea. Uh, some people look at the mountain and they say, well, that's way too high to climb, and I'm not going to get involved in this because there are other things to do. We agree. It's a very high mountain to climb. Uh, it's got all those elements in it. Uh, one of the things that people have referred to our work as is a nonviolent civil disobedience through municipal lawmaking. It's about sitting down at a different lunch counter, and this time the lunch counter is your actual community, to seize it back from being property of the state to actually being a self-governing entity. That's a huge shift in American law. The retainer agreements we sign with municipalities say, we understand that that's a huge shift in American law, and we authorize you to argue that in the courts when we get there. Uh, but all to say, that's how that's how these things are constructed. And a final word before I turn it over to Kushka, uh, which is that it's become sexy to talk about the commons. Uh, we hear that a lot, you know, the commons. Uh, commons is a One of the things that I had in my talk that I, I didn't mention was that when we use the word commons, we're actually using shorthand for common property. That's what the commons means. We would submit to you that the word commons cannot be applied to nature or ecosystems. Because nature and ecosystems, if we're going to survive in this place, cannot be treated as property under the law. So this word is very dangerous. It's the commons, public trust stuff. I hope Mary Wood uh, will forgive me for all of this. Uh, because a lot of the climate work that she does is based on public trust. And it's natural that we would climb into the property stuff which has been developing since the Roman days to try to seize a legal theory that we can use to protect the environment. The problem is, is that those foundations of that property law have been laid that way for a reason, which is they were never intended to be applied to ecosystems and natural theories. And we would submit that it's a dead end to try to use property law and common property concepts to actually protect nature. And as the last analogy, it would be like taking a slave and making the slave the common property of the community rather than the slave of the community, right? So that the community could still, the slave is still property. The African American is still property under the law. It's just that they become common property rather than the property of the individual. And so we think that's the wrong law. Uh, and that's why our work takes off at yeah, the point where it does. <laughs> Quite a bit of time for, for questions. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. As Thomas is explaining, uh, the the only reason to be in appearance at these things, whether it's the workshop or the keynote, is really to see are there actually people in the room 
willing to actually do something on the ground. And there are actually people in the room today doing this kind of work. Although Thomas talked about uh, things back east, because this is where the stuff has come from, it's actually starting to sprout here in this region of the country. And for those that have been in this region uh, and may not have been following this stuff, it may be surprising to hear that the the really the, the wellspring of sorts or the inspirer of other communities to be doing this work today is Spokane, Washington. And Spokane's not known to be a very progressive community for those that know Spokane. Uh, but like those communities back east, folks have been dealing with their issues and running into the same kind of structure. Okay, they've been running into the wall and they were tired. And they decided that something new had to take place, that their work in essence wasn't getting to the end game that they wanted to get to. When I, when I say the work, it was people working with trying to create affordable, affordable housing in Spokane, people trying to uh, protect the Spokane River, neighborhoods being subjected to unwanted development, why, why does the system work the way it is, and the reality is almost is any issue you drop into it operates pretty much the same way structurally. So these people are all running into the same structure, and they finally decided to come together collectively. So you have labor unions coming together with environmentalists, coming together with social justice people, coming together with neighborhood advocates. And they were actually the inspiration for the Bill of Rights sections that you find in all these ordinances. They were the first community to drive forward the community Bill of Rights. In essence, if this is about the community, we actually have to address this issue on a structural level. In essence, re-engineer what government is about, or really what government, who government is for. Because as Thomas has been explaining, it's been, that, you know, that the deck is stacked in one direction. And we see how it's stacked in the direction of the corporate view, over us many here at the community level, and again, it's usually the threat that gets us mobilized. Um, and so I'm interested to see if there's folks in the room actually willing to do something on the ground. Like I said, there are folks here in, in Bend County and Lane County that are actually driving forward now with the food bill of rights. In essence, they're done doing the regulatory stuff and trying to get out the harms, whether it's overuse of pesticides, whether it's not a genetically modified crops, whether it's the expansion of the mill in areas in which people understand you can't have habits because you're about to destroy the whole industry around organic seed production, and looking to see how that state structure continues to validate the destruction at the local level. And again, no matter what issue you run into, it's going to operate the same. So these people are actually creating new law and are beginning to drive that forward to take on all the structural stuff that uh, Thomas talked about and that we'll continue to explore here. Uh, so my role is to come in and help support these these uh, these communities uh, to do some of the more financial uh, foundational educational stuff to help with the legal stuff to help with the organizing stuff because this is a new way to come together we're not used to coming together in this manner because you are picking a fight this is a big fight that people are, are picking when they do this kind of work and again we don't make light of it we explain what people are up against um, and so you're going to get knocked down more than you are actually going to moving forward, it's going to be very discouraging. Uh, but I think folks that do this work understand that they're driving at the heart of what makes the machine work. It's about dismantling that machine and actually putting something together that's about people and communities and the environment and actually putting us in a position to decide what that actually looks like. And so a lot of people say, well, that, doesn't that actually equate to something more about what democracy should be about? So a lot of people get into this idea that we don't even really have democracy today. So this work has this edge about actually creating a more democratic community environment for our sake, for the environment's sake. And as Thomas was explaining, it doesn't just stop at the boundaries of Lane County or Benton County or wherever this stuff is happening, but eventually has to get up to that higher level. Because you need that higher level to recognize the authority of the low, lower level at some point. There has to be reorientation of power. And so a lot of this is also getting at power. Where does power reside? Where does power always reside? And I think unfortunately we're running into a thing where power has always resided in the hands no matter what we've been sold or convinced that we have or what liberties we've been allowed uh, to enjoy and how that should be enough. And so one more kind of visual, um, Thomas has mentioned that you know communities sit within a certain structure of what's allowable. So our easy visual for it is that we call a box of allowable activism. In essence, here's your box you've been allowed to play in. And so long as you don't step outside the box, you're fine. So the best that we try to do within the box is to reach the furthest parts of the corner without ever stepping the boundary of the box. And what's the box sided with? If you take the screen as an example of the box, you have the creation piece on one side, you have the Dillon's rule on the other side, you have corporate personhood rights on the other side, you have other corporate constitutional rights on that fourth side. And that, that's not a static thing, it's a dynamic thing in which it's always constantly being 
squished down on you. So if you take the ag stuff, for instance, so you have this expansion of canola now being grown where the local locals have said that's a bad idea, or this, uh, there's legislation now at the state that makes even this, the uh, state preemption stuff more explicit around local control. So in essence, actually pulling local control away around things like seed heritage, so seed saving stuff, saying you don't have the power to decide that, it's us, the state, that gets to do that. They already have that power, but they're making it more clear. They're sticking you in the eye with it to make it even more clear that you have no power at the local level. And so the more we run into this, typically is more how communities start to, to decide to act outside of it. So in essence, it's turning your back on what is deemed to be the legitimate system to actually create the legitimate system. And so by participating in it, as Thomas said, you're validating what it is. These communities are saying we're no longer interested in validating a system that doesn't actually give us a decision and power to decide what happens. That's an unjust system. We're actually going to blaze a path and create a just system. And these Bill of Rights, these local ordinances, are the vehicle to do so. It's a collective way to do so. So it's in some ways, in my mind, an evolution from what we continue still to do, which probably still has merit around the civil disobedience individually, to actually to come together collectively to drive that change. And it's a very different manner when you actually use your local laws, the lever, to actually expose what is, in most cases, invisible. Um, it's a different way to actually elevate that, that consciousness, that discussion. But it's all about behavioral change. It's about cultural change, really, is what this work is about. And you're using the law, in essence, to try to get that culture to catch up and backfill what we know needs to have happen. So that's what's starting to take place here uh, in Oregon, in the states of Washington, whether it's in Bellingham, or up in Washington County, or in Spokane, or what's beginning to, to take place in Portland, uh, Hawaiian Island. So people out west uh, are starting this heat has been happening back east and understanding that this is the pathway that we have to, uh, to take ourselves in. So that's about all I have as far as any kind of a presentation piece. And I, I guess I'm interested to see what folks have to say about uh, questions they may have or actually how do you actually start something like this in your own community. So that's to start somewhere. And it typically starts with a handful of people like we know all these stuff usually starts in. Well, here within Lane County, we're just starting to get clear. We're up against, in Oregon, against a single issue, uh, which kind of limits how we phrase our community bill of rights. So um, right now, Corvallis is up against a, a, a lawsuit, the uh, corporation and Congress law, as well as they're fighting the, uh, the, the uh, NOLA, the Food Control Right. So our question is, um, how do we how do you pass that single issue within Oregon? As well as, um, we're going to need, in order to formulate our Bill of Rights, we're trying to go towards November's ballot. We're going to need a lot of activists to circulate petitions. We're talking about up against about 8,000 signatures. So what, what she was referencing is, in Oregon, when you run a citizen's initiative, the first step is we have a constitutional review. And what it is is to look to make sure that you're not uh, putting just, uh, multiple issues into one piece of legislation. So they call it a single subject test. Uh, the folks in Benton County have ran food bill of rights. Uh, they appealed their current county attorney's decision on it. It went to the courts. The judge made a ruling that there wasn't one aspect of the food bill of rights that didn't meet single subject. Uh, and what they're doing now is revising it to actually get it through that particular filter. All that, all that really is about is not to discourage things moving forward. It's just to say there's always going to be hurdles, and this is one other hurdle that you have to deal with. This is new stuff. So the courts haven't seen this. County attorneys haven't seen this. Um, if they have a more favorable view of, of the after business boys, they're going to find a way to throw a wrench in it. Um, there's always ways to adjust to this stuff. And in fact, what happened in Benton County doesn't necessarily happen in Lane County because it's county-specific kind of stuff. The stuff doesn't go out. There's no precedent set into any other place. If, for instance, the single subject thing is tossed out <coughs> in that first run, uh, what people have to understand is that stuff that happens everywhere, whether it's constitutional review stuff, whether it's pre election challenges, uh, whether it's post adoption challenges on the other end, that system is going to try to jam you into the box. Because you have to remember the system is built under 200 years worth of law to validate the what is. And when you drive to actually create the what needs to be, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit you over the head in multiple ways. So this is what happens. Uh, in these kinds of cases, uh, whether it's around buying initiatives or other things, this is how the groups, the groups have to expect this stuff. And it's a matter of what they do when they're actually hit with that, how they actually keep dragging forward. 
uh, that's what we have to learn in this new kind of organizing is that the legal system isn't our friend for the most degrees, okay? And in a lot of cases, judges are one person that make, that's one person's opinion. You know, it's very, sometimes very little law actually gets made in legal decisions. It's, it's more political than it is legal. And so we have to shed this whole idea that somehow the courts are going to be our friend on this thing. Because we understand that in most cases they're not going to be our friends, but it's about testing to see where they may or they may not be. Um, and so it's, it's really, that's how deep this stuff needs to go around our thinking about how to drive this stuff forward and sort of what we've had sort of faith or hope in actually helping us. In a shorthand form, there is no silver bullet solution to this stuff. It's multifaceted, multidimensional, and it's going to take a lot of communities doing the same kind of work to actually crack the thing to the degree that it needs to. Uh, I, I, I think many of them, I think we're just a while back. Louder? Louder. 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 Um, so, I live in Portland. There are a lot of people from Portland here. Anyway, um, we have a lot of things going for us that are really nice with starting campaigns like this. One thing is that there's a whole bunch of shit happening in Portland that nobody thought could happen in Portland. Um, the, the CRC you went through right now, we sort of pushed through coal trains coming through, you know, a lot of things that people were just, you know, we're still flabbergasted or being proposed. The other thing that we have about, and so a lot of people are active, right? The other thing that we have about Oregon is that, as I understand, our um, our uh, home rule doctrine is very expensive. And the, the little writing that's actually been done on it um, says basically we don't invalidate anything that is isn't at the state level or has a, uh, there was a criminal law. So as long as we're not passing criminal laws at county and city levels, we do just about anything we want and have a presumption of legality. So there's a lot of tools to work with. Um, and I'd say maybe getting some of these, you know, the people working on community rights already very active, the people that are working on bridge opposition, like coalition for the future, very, very active, the people that organized the fluoride referendum, which no matter what you think about that, getting 40,000 signatures in a matter of a month to overrule a city council decision is a huge deal. Um, and then the people working on coal is a really nice group to put together for something right away. So. I think, just quickly, that I mean, it's very easy to get bogged down in the law. There's so much law in this. I'm not a lawyer. Most of the time they hate talking about the law. Um, but it's an aspect of this work, because you've got to understand where it comes from. Um, I think where this stuff tends to build easier in communities aren't being hit over the head with something. This is usually where this stuff happens. It's the communities are being tracked, or factory farms are coming in, or I mean, you see, you visually can see it, you tactically can feel like you're being harmed by it. It's the crisis kind of stuff that maybe that's the human thing. Uh, in communities where it's not as visible, it's a lot harder to organize this kind of stuff. So sometimes it's just simply posing a question going from, you know, what can we give to what do we want? Sort of shifting people into the what we want category is a big move for people because you get conditioned to go after what you can give based on that box that's been created for you. So all your thinking, all your efforts, all your funding, all your policy stuff goes to what you can try to get under the system that you have and making minor modifications, let's say through statutory law kind of stuff. But it's a lot different when you ask when you ask people what do you want? It's a very different ballgame. And to see how that's evolved in one community, Spokane, it was about shifting that question and then and then eventually putting it within a rights-based framework. And so today, when you ask people who should have more rights about what happens in your neighborhood, that corporate developer, or are you the neighborhood residents when it comes to large-scale development? And almost hands down, people will say, it's we, the residents, because we live there. And so there's this democratization, in essence, that's happening around who actually makes the decisions, which is a very different sort of question to actually pose people. And so a lot of times, this is how the stuff may build if you're not dealing with something that is as stark as fracking happening um, in your community. I'm from British um, Columbia, Canada, and so I've got all kinds of questions and observations about how this does and doesn't relate to uh, the Canadian Supreme Court. I'd love to talk about some of that, but I won't ask that now. Um, we're, uh, as many of you probably know, both, uh, one of the biggest debates, environmental debates in British Columbia right now is over the Amber uh, Pipeline, which uh, goes from the tar pan to, would go to the, um, uh, to the coast uh, to ship uh, tar pan oil uh, China by tanker. Um, and um, uh, one of the, the opposition there has really been led by First Nations communities, by indigenous communities who are passing joint declarations 
saying that this is the, we still have our lawmaking authority as, as indigenous nations, and this these pipelines are against our law. And, and this is the same Fraser Declaration has been signed by over 100 First Nations taking that position. The Coastal First Nations Declaration that takes the position by oil tanks. Um, and uh, it seems to me that what, the, and then there have been some local, local governments that have passed, municipalities that have passed uh, resolutions supporting uh, that work. And it seems to me that this is very much uh, in keeping with what you're talking about, but you haven't, I haven't heard you speak either in the keynote or, or yet about the, the role of indigenous governments um, uh, in this work. And I wonder if you could comment on that. That's a lot. <laughs> First on the comparative law stuff, there's almost nothing done by the legal industry on comparing different country laws dealing with corporations and the interplay with community stuff. We've had to invent it. And so in Canada, we're developing a Canadian curriculum. We taught a democracy school at McGill University several years ago, and one of the professors there with his students actually began helping us develop a Canadian curriculum. The Canadian system has a lot of parallels with ours, but it's actually better for doing this work than the U.S. because not all of the U.S. stuff has been exported yet, but it's coming. I mean, you can watch the progression of the law as it builds. Uh, for example, the commerce stuff, which really hits us in U.S. communities, uh, not in Canada yet, but they're trying to devise it. And what's fascinating is when you, if you have the time to look, you can actually see how U.S. law is 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 being driven into other places. And sometimes it's, it's it's actually constant at the same time as environmental law is being driven into those places. And so you get that expanding out. It's a very difficult field. We were in Ireland. They asked us to do comparative law. We had to hire an Irish law firm. In Ecuador, we had to file, hire an Ecuadorian law firm to do the work. It all got to be done from scratch. So I wish there were easier answers. But in Canada, the easiest answer to give is that it's easier to do this work there. However, the mindset seems to be harder. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. We've had 10, 15 communities contact us. Only one decided to move forward with something. It's over in uh, Nova Scotia. And it's an anti-fracking ordinance. It hasn't passed yet, but it's actually in front of the council for consideration. That's the only place that we've Turning to your other question about uh, tribal stuff, uh, indigenous communities, as well as uh, the uh, Enbridge pipeline is that there have been resolutions passed, but they're all non-binding. They're all non-binding resolutions. The local government, that's true. Yes. The, the, the First Nations, they are asserting that they actually have that law. They're asserting it, but they haven't made it. There's, it's, I mean, we, we, it's like the Walmart myth, is that the fact is the tribal governments need approval for certain charter bylaw stuff from the federal government. Uh, but but the, what they're asserting is that under the Constitution, Section 35 of the Constitution, Act 1982, that they have still have traditional powers. Yes, I understand, um, but they're not actually asserting those lawmaking They are. Well, we, we looked, and we got called in, and we actually reviewed them. So if you have new information, I'd love to see it. But nobody's called us. And okay. so we, we we don't help when we don't get a call in. We're kind of like the vampires. you got to invite us in. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, tribal stuff in the U.S. has been a disappointment. I wish I could explain why, but it tends to be indigenous communities are even more colonized than white I know that's a, you know, a borderline thing to say, perhaps. Um, yeah, it's been very, very difficult. The furthest we got was in Alaska, where we did a democracy school for tribal elders who came into first school. Um, there were some parallels, there weren't others. Uh, and in New Mexico, uh, in uh, some of the indigenous communities there who are beginning to move stuff forward. We'd love to help. We've received no phone calls from any communities dealing with Keystone XL. Zero. Even though we reached out, put op-eds in Texas newspapers, in Nebraska newspapers, even had a couple conference calls with some of the Nebraska folks, zero, absolutely zero from those. Uh, and so it tends to be you have to arrive at a certain point before you begin to do something different. I don't think those communities have arrived at that point yet. So that's the best answer. But if you do have they stuff, yeah, I mean, I think we probably should uh, talk. But the um, we're actually. Many of us in, in UC, I think, are actually holding the first the first name the search that their their lawmaking may actually force the Canadian law to rethink itself. That would be great. Um, so you know, there's, there's a lot of thinking going on in there. there particularly because British Columbia doesn't actually have any treaties, so yeah. that is very little of its territory in any way. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a very exciting time. In, in, the, in the U.S., we've had tribal governments adopt resolutions that say we have lawmaking. 
authority. But they won't they don't pass the next step, which is actually to adopt a legal structure that can be enforced. That's the problem in the US. Maybe it's different there, but the the fact is we have yet to come to an indigenous community who is willing to actually use their tribal power to enforce it against the corporation, which is the what we're looking for. And so tribal communities in the US have more room to roam than municipal governments. They're in a better position because they're tribal communities. However, in the US, indigenous communities like to say all the time we're sovereign, and they're not. The, I mean, under the law, it's very clear they're wards of the state. And so we're trying to help make that sovereignty happen, but they're wards of the state in the US. So thank you. Let's go towards the back, and we'll move our way forward again. We have to get along the step the back. Is there some way uh, to cut short uh, the groundwork that communities are doing to assert their own interests, or at least to facilitate their choices through in Oregon the initiative process, whereby, and I was just writing some things to myself, such as giving local communities the preference over corporate actions in affecting environmental issues. I mean, do you think an initiative like that would be fairly universally received as a good and, and valid uh, amendment to the uh, Oregon Constitution or in addition to the Oregon statutes? I think that's where we see things ending up. Why not? Why not? go at the same time. I think the, the thinking is there's really nothing underneath that. I mean, it's an assertion of it at the higher level already. But in looking at, I mean, the evidence that when we go back to is how other people's movements built. They all built from the local of the essence to have enough force to crack the upper, even though they understood that the upper levels of government have to be dealt with. And so, so it, seems, it seems like that's the, the, you know, the straightest, fastest point from point A to point B then you go after the state level. And maybe in the state of Oregon, that, that can happen faster than it's happened in other places. And in some degrees, Oregon's in a more advantageous position. Besides statutory law, you can make constitutional change through citizens' initiative, which is not the case in other states. So there's the ability to make a deeper structural change through direct legislation. The question is, how do you build enough underneath to actually drive the stuff dealing with all the complexity of what we've been trying to lay out here, which most people don't see and understand why that needs to take place. Because usually the backslide is into a specific issue and not about the structure itself. So it's about making sure that enough people understand that the structural change is needed, and yes, it's needed at the state level. Um, and so until you have that, that capacity and that's how to do it, um, it makes it awfully difficult to actually make it through or have a viable chance of making it through. Now you can go out tomorrow file that initiative and see what happens. And you know, maybe that's another way to go about it. I think uh, what we've seen is that you need to, there has to be a building element to it just in the sense that there's enough force so that it's, it's, uh, it's obvious that that kind of change has to have happened. Because I don't think in a large degree that people see it as obvious yet, even though the people in this room may see it as obvious. So there's gonna be different ways to go at it. Um, we still think it's the community level stuff that is going to be the driving agent at this moment through the state level stuff. I see it as potentially working in tandem with the type of work you're doing and also thereby supporting the community rights yeah. through a constitutional or statutory law initiative. I think if there's people, time, and energy to do that, then, then they should go for it. I think we would be very supportive of seeing that, that discussion happening at the legislative level, whether through direct legislation or, or true forcing of legislators to actually adopt this kind of stuff. We're starting to explore that in other states with actually state level legislation to begin to do this reorientation of how the state looks at the local. And so it's going to probably take multi prong efforts to do that stuff. And so if there's people willing to do it already, then I would say go for it. It's also important to understand, though, that the that the, it's important that the organizing be democratic. Um, this isn't like a Ralph Nader style organizing where experts get in a room, they write something, then they go out and program people to petition for it and get it passed. These ordinances are blueprints of a new constitution. That's what they are. And so until you blueprint enough places that actually have enough power to drive it, 
you're going to run up against the inevitable forces, which are environmental groups coming out against it because they're opposed to local control over certain types of decisions, which we've run into before. You run into the corporate voice who will go Hail Mary to stop communities from having that kind of decision-making authority. They'll try to block the initiative. Uh, but strategically, what you're trying to do is take out Dylan's rule, and you're trying to take out state preemption, and you're trying to take out state constitutional personhood in one whack. So you're trying to clean the state level so that you can then have a clean platform to run the federal stuff. So we just finished drafting model legislation, which is right up that line. But we don't think that the underneath is there yet to run it because there's just not the power. You've got to force it. And to force it, you've got to build those low levels up enough to actually put it in. Yeah, hey, uh, I want to direct this to Thomas. Thomas, uh, Senate Bill 299 in uh, Alaska. Uh, it was, uh, the issue was naturally occurring asbestos in gravel. Uh, the reason I'm bringing that to your mind, uh, we have a similar, exactly similar crisis in Dexter, Oregon called Harbin Butte. And if what we're dealing with is the local government has refused to give us what we call a site review, which uh, allows us to protect ourselves from physical, you know, it's public health and safety, okay? It's, something the federal government also gives us. The problem is the state government, LUBA, has also denied us local people a site review. We are property owners, taxpayers. And I can't wait until the year 2015 because we are being exposed to fibrous asbestos particulates. And it's not an option. I have the evidence with me. And we have been blocked by every single form of judicial government in this community and Faye Stewart, the district, the commissioner for our district has let us down and he has sold us out and we are desperate. I understand the process. We hired the attorney and went through that. I am fighting for the rights of you property owners in Lane County. It's not just me that I'm ringing the bell for. We are being exposed and the Eugene Weekly had an article about the Buttes being under attack. Yeah, we saw the letter to the other. Yeah, the this is uh, it's, it's spooky. It's funny how all the acronyms. What can we do? You know, we have LUPA, we have LURK in Maine, we have SLURPA, I think. Like something like that. It's like, you know, the acronyms just are all over the place. I mean, the, 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 the solution is you got to start now. I mean, you gotta, you got to override LUPA, you got to override the state and stuff. And because otherwise you have no options. Yeah, well, Thomas, February 6th, Luba made their call, their decision, to not give us a side review. So we were in limbo until they made well, that. Part of me wants to say, who gives a fuck what Luba? Well, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> don't, don't, don't give it credence. Don't, I mean, just run without it. And, and actually invalidate whatever Luba's contrary decisions are within the ordinance. I mean, just assert it, man. I mean, you you, you got to move out of, of you wow. know. The, the box, there's no quick fix here. It's about organizing people who have done all the loop of stuff that you've been doing, going back to them and saying, you've wasted your time because this is not a place where we go for remedy. We have to create some new structure. So there's nothing fast about this. There's nothing, you know, it takes commitment. It's going to take people and time and everything else. Well, by the time they're done, Parkland View will be flat. So we're under the, we are under this crisis. So well, like I said, the fracking folks, you know, there's, yeah, they're fracking us, there's right. going to be slacking tomorrow. There's going to be pumping the next day. There's, I mean, it's endless. It's, it's endless. You know, they're now burning topsoil for, you know, soil burners for power. It's, they will take everything. And so the view, I understand the need to protect it, but it may not be able to be protected at this point. Well, you're, at this you're, point, I'm worried right. about protecting my health. So. What you're protecting is the next <laughs> Yeah. And what you're protecting is the next, is the kids that Somebody, Barbara yeah. Butte is on the website. If you want to look at a tragedy, there it is in Living Color. Thank you. Um, I took the two-day workshop with Policy Employee Ghost, and one of the things I really struck me was the mention of corporate charters and how corporate charters are given by what we do
The problem with the charter revocation stuff is usually it's in the hands of the attorney general, and you can't force it. So one of our first cases in 96 was actually suing the Waste Management Corporation seeking a revocation of their charter in the state of Pennsylvania because they had 30,000 environmental violations over the past seven years. I mean, at some point, it just gets, becomes really funny. You know, you know, the 30,000 environmental violations committed by the company, their legal counsel came in and said that was proof that the environmental laws worked. <laughs> because they got caught 30,000 times. And so we, our, our pitch was that citizens should have the authority to enforce the charter revocation provision against the corporation. The court disagreed and basically said the power is just with the attorney general's office. We've moved from charter revocation now, really, altogether, because it's about punishing a bad company. That's usually how it's portrayed or framed. And the problem is the problem is the powers that lie across with everyone. It's not what corporations do illegally, it's what corporations do legally that's the problem. And so the charter revocation stuff in some ways validates the bad stuff, which is if we just take out the bad actor, we'll be okay. And so we've pitched the little bit not to say, it might not be valuable in specific cases where it serves an organizing purpose that can spin off. Uh, but for now, we pretty much abandoned that and, and moved on to other things. Yeah, uh, Gunter Amroth, uh, Siskiyou Wild Rivers area, Illinois Valley, the uh, Kilmer Tribe. Hey.
trade zone. Which means that if you're engaged in interstate commerce, there's no there's no boundaries or hurdles that can be put up by the state to that commerce. Uh, and in fact, it's been read by the Supreme Court more extensively than that, that anything that affects interstate commerce. So it's not, it doesn't even have to be direct, it can be indirect. Because of that, the commerce clause structure was actually used as the model to export out to these other, these other agreements. Um, I will say that those international agreements have to be taken on as well. So as difficult as it is, you need state level change, you need federal change, and then you need to drive something that nullifies the international stuff. Because otherwise, we're under that too. All, all by Wednesday. That stuff is not. <laughs> that stuff's not just theoretical. I mean, well, uh, after this workshop is another workshop to kind of highlight specific communities that have been doing this work uh, here in the Northwest. One including Bellingham. Bellingham actually put forward a community bill of rights that prohibited the coal trains from coming through Bellingham. And of course, the arguments against you can't do that because it violates international trade agreements. So this stuff isn't just what you read in the papers, but affects us even on a community level. So not only not only the state law and the federal law, but now you have international law if you actually want to go and protect your community against what you see as a harm. This is how deep this stuff is. And so when we say blow up the structure, we literally mean to blow up the structure because the necess- there is no there is no remedy within what we have today. No matter how much good we try to, to do, the collective impact is the collective impact. And the decision being made under the structure that we have the question is, can we continue to live under that structure, or do we go after something different, which is what these builder rights are showing can be possible. Uh, and the question is historic. Um, you stand up, please. So 
it's, again, it's multidimensional, that uh, situation we're dealing with. So even just the corporate charter stuff wouldn't be enough to actually stamp the, the, the destruction that we're seeing today that's being driven by the corporate. So the question was, what's the template for creating a community bill of rights? Um, I don't think it's a, uh, uh, I think it's a good question because people want to know where do I start. So it usually starts because someone there's an issue at hand, whatever it is. There's usually a small collection of people that that want to do something about it. Uh, those folks may have been involved in the current process that stands today, and they may have never been activists, never ever back before. Uh, and so usually it's you know it's the kitchen table conversations. As Thomas said, we don't just show up anywhere. We get phone calls. We get asked to help. And so we would then, if you said we've got an issue and, and we want to do something structurally about it in the sense of passing a new law, uh, we would then help you in drafting that. So if the group itself, the community itself, the local elected officials are actually drafting this law, we assist with that. Uh, and then uh, if you can't get elected officials to put it into play, and you have an initiative process that's about building a campaign to actually drive it forward to a vote of the people, uh, and then it gets adopted as a shorthand of how this stuff progresses. Of course, there's lots of road back, road roadblocks and challenges and learning along the way. Um, but I think it's basically about stepping into the understanding that it's not the issue itself, but also it's the structure of the line that allows the issue to continue to be in the way that it is. So the issue is important. That's usually what brings people together. It's usually what we're trying to protect. But we have to understand the decision-making process is built a certain way to disempower us from actually truly protecting them. So this is why it's such a shift away from what is to what needs to be. Um, but it, it does start with you know people being concerned enough, you know, willing to step forward, you know, drafting something and trying to get adopted, and then ultimately enforcing it. Because if the laws just sit there and aren't enforced, then what's the point? Uh, in essence, it's all about how do we drive the behavioral and cultural changes through lawmaking. Because the lawmaking is also, even at the state and federal, it's not the end point. It's really, it's really the frame of which we've decided now this is how we want to interact as a society, whether it's to one another or the environment, and understanding that you can't have these corporate decision makers, the corporate few, dictating down. You see, you see the results of it, whether it's environmentally, socially, economically. Um, so it's, it's that big of a shift of which communities are undertaking by doing what they're doing at the local level, at least traditionally. Yeah, um, food would need to get back into activism. We failed in energy, food, and civil liberty protection. The film, Our Earth, the Operator's Manual, mentions only 1% of the world's energy is supplied by renewables, and only 1% of the farms in the uh, United States are farmed organically. So there's the 1% for you. 80% of the ingredients in conventionally grown food is not GM. So practices destroy land, air, water, drive our economy, and they affect the 99% regarding food and energy. Practices promoting clean renewables and organic food have achieved only 1% success. I am a board member of uh, the newly energized TILF Foundation, and we are a North, North, Northwest nonprofit aspiring to preserve organic and sustainable farms and homesteads into perpetuity by preserving the farm history and then our LLCs or land trusts or B corporation mode and how to get those farms turned into the next generation. And this is a great job for the young people today to get back to nature, work on the internet part time and work on the farm part time. Let's figure out how to do it. My name is Kathy Ging, G-I-N-G, and then the phone book. <laughs> Um, the idea I like is can we go to the bottom line and really hurt them? School lands, railroad lands, homestead lands. The majority of that is taken through fraud by the corporate corrupt operations, I call them. Uh, this, these public lands, can we, can we take them back? Millions of acres, can we take them back? I, mean, I think in a lot of ways it's about reorienting what we consider to be, you know, what property should trump what property in some ways. Um, I mean, the reality of the railroads is, is the sequel we may see them as being, is they did everything, most of everything they've done, they've done through the legal structure. In essence, they've got legal protections to be able to do what they did. They have negotiations to get the land that they did. They even actually passed up at the federal level that actually insulates them from antitrust attacks. So 
where they found themselves within the law itself in order to perpetuate what they want to do. And so it's no surprise that we're at where we're at when the structure validates that kind of decision making power. So I think the community rights stuff that's happening is actually pushing back on that, that kind of control over the destruction of property. So in essence, that you can no longer destroy this property just because you think you have title to that property. So it, it forces a clash even on what private property rights mean in relation to the impact to the whole because you're allowed to actually extract something or destroy something or force down or whatever it is. Uh, that that's not going to be allowable under this new structure of law. So you, it is about, in essence, taking that land back and preservation for the land, uh, for the land's sake. So in, in some ways that is about about taking something back that shouldn't have been there in the first place. So I, I really appreciate, I think you're, like the strategy that you're approaching sort of makes a lot of sense to me, and so I really appreciate it. And I'm wondering, in terms of organizing model, you got a bunch of people in the room here who are interested enough with you sitting here. I'm wondering whether you are planning to or might want to allow for a little bit of geographic space organizing in the final minutes of this time so that, like some people raise their hands already saying, oh, we're already doing this in Lane County or Benton County. Other people might want to find each other and say, oh, you were that, I was that too, we both live near each other, let's get together. It's like, what's the next step from here? People sitting in this panel, right? So like, people getting together enough to say, we want to take the next step with this. We want to call you in to come to two-day democracy school where we are or something. So I'm wondering if you can allow a few minutes for that bridge to happen or you want to find each other on GRC. Tied to that, there's a workshop right after this that gets more into the nuts and bolts of what it's looked like at the community level so people can get more steeped into how it's looked in Spokane or Bellingham or Benton County. Uh, Paul Cienfuegos, who's sitting over there, is going to lead that. A couple of us will be part of that workshop. In addition, a lot of this background material, whether it's a democracy school or understanding where the Constitution comes from, uh, Paul spent a number of years accumulating various texts. Um, if you go to policyandfuegos.com or some of the books he has here with today, it gives more of the learning that you may have not gotten to this point. So um, I think, yeah, in the last few minutes, um, if you want to take the lead, say where you're from, and then see if others pop up and self-organize. Um, and then check with me, and we can figure it out from there. Yeah, well, I have, I guess, a couple of One, I would be very curious to hear some more about
uh, but we have a list of litigation cases uh, that we can make available to folks who are moving on certain things. We tend not to send our stuff out to anyone who's not actually physically working on organizing a community, because that's where it's the most important. And plus, the corporate boys have a bullseye on our back as well, because they are generating papers on our work. And we had the opportunity to get PowerPoint recently that one of the large DC firms put together on us that said, this is how you dismantle the x y It's very helpful to have, because then we can begin to customize the work. But we're, and I don't want to sound nasty, but we're only interested in people who are actually going to do something, and then helping them to support that along the way. But all to say is, of course, the courts are going to strike. There's going to be thousands of laws. I mean, it's important when we start out with municipalities to say that. And we're only going to represent you as a municipality if you actually take it all the way through. So we don't want, we've had before municipalities repealing their ordinances when heat got too hot, and we don't do that anymore. So we actually sign agreements with them that they're going to take it from start. So, you know that's not satisfying. So, self-organizing, is that the... And maybe two more questions, then we'll do that. Is there a strategy that you have with the media? Like, why did you say the mainstream media would just, you know, slaughter this all? Well, the uh, Eugene Weekly did a pretty good job on that piece that they did. I know. We tried to slaughter it. But, the, you know, we have Associated Press reports to cover stuff from time to time. We've actually brought them through. We understand the organizing process with members of the media. Uh, and so all of our media tends to be local. There's from time to time, like the Nation article piece that got done, which came out last month, the feature piece on our work, uh, was done by a reporter that we have a 10-year relationship with, uh, who was hired by the Nation to actually begin doing that work on that piece. So there are inroads there. Uh, but uh, generally, we work with local city-based media to actually bring those folks along. As with funders, foundation personnel have to be brought through a, through a process as well. It's not just communities that need to be organized, it's the media folks and also the funders. So. Maybe one more question right in the back there. Um, it seems like the discourse of rights and power is a very potent mobilizing force, but if you look at like libertarian conservatism, it's very often decoupled from like a recognition of civic responsibility or a social and environmental interdependency. So what I'm wondering is, do you think um, the legal aspect, the legal angle is very important, it seems like, but I'm wondering, does there also, do you think there also needs to be like an educational component with that to bring that cultural and mental change that you're talking about as well? Um, as far as our organization goes, you know, these democracy schools, for that educational piece, uh, with the understanding that they're meant to be, uh, you know, springboards into the actual world. So they're not just education for education's sake, but yeah, they're about getting people to understand the frame, about creating, in essence, a new rights platform to move up from, but not actually go beneath them when you're talking about civil rights protections, for instance. And actually very targeted to say that these are about corporate practices coming in, in essence, stripping the corporate power against the community's rights to assert its own protection for its health, safety, and welfare. Um, so you'll see some interesting, what seem like parallels at times between other sort of libertarian kind of viewpoints. And there, there is a bit of crossover in some realms, but this work is, is different than that that kind of work. Um, but yeah, they, 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 there are moments where they seem like they're, they're speaking the same kind of work. Um, so maybe to do this self-organizing thing, if you want to stand up and say where you're from, and to see if people want to meet in one part of the room, and someone else can do so from another part. She could so actually that create the process better than you are. What's that? <laughs> if, if you give Tree authority, she'll create the process. Oh, great. Right. Right. So Come if back. you're someone who uh, is either already doing this or thinks you might want to do this and you want to connect with other people who are based geographically near where you're based, at least like check in, maybe exchange contact info, figure out a next step. If you're someone who wants to have a conversation like that, wants to be a contact point for a spot, just for this moment, not a 10 year contact point for the spot, stand up now. The rest of us, let's stay seated. I want to get at least one person standing up from the Lane County folks, one person from Bent County, and anyone else who you want to know whether there's somebody else in the room from your spot who might want to have a conversation about this. Anyone who wants to announce the geographic location, stand up. We're going to do just all you have to do is say the location. We don't even need to know your name or your email or anything. Just say the location. No other rant or what your issue is. Just the location. 
okay? And then wave at people. So then enough for the people who want to come to that spot to come find you. And then this will wrap. And the next panel, which that's Paul Cienfuegos, for anyone who doesn't know, he and others will be on the next thing, just right here in the same room. So for the 15 minutes between now and then, anyone who wants to gather a little geographic node can do that. Okay, so save your geographic spot, sit down, and then once all those spots have been announced, go find those people, and then uh, have that, yeah? You good? Yep. good. Okay, so what's your spot? Shout it out. Yeah, Portland over there. Say it again. Portland. Portland over there with Edwin and Green. Yeah. Lane County uh, over there. By the screen. Lane County by the screen. Yeah. Humboldt County right here. Humboldt County right here. Lincoln County. Lincoln County. Another one? Yamhill County. Yamhill County. Deschutes County. Deschutes County. Anyone else standing waiting to announce a spot? Yes. Josephine County. Josephine County. Yamhill County. Yamhill County. Great. All right. That's it.